My Experience in a Haunted Mansion by Uncle Perry and Aunt Renee, based on a true story. Back in 1984, I lived in a 130-year-old, 18-room furnished Victorian mansion in the rural part of South Carolina. It was owned by the same family for all those years. But hard times fell on the family, and they had to start running out the place. The house was in disrepair and desperately needed some TLC. For example, there were still animal stalls in the basement from the back where they used to keep livestock to slaughter for the family males. Also, the kitchen looked like it was last renovated in the 1970s. It had yellow linoleum floors and the walls were also painted yellow. The appliances were likewise from that era. It probably hadn't been inspected by the county in many years. To say that it was outdated is a massive understatement. It consisted of three floors and a dark, creepy basement and attic. According to the owners, it has a deep, rich history. In fact, I was even told that Thomas Jefferson had slept in the same bed that I was sleeping in. Most of the furniture was from that era. It had a beautiful spiral staircase that led to the bedrooms on the second floor. The bedroom door across the hall from my bedroom had a hinged bar lock on the outside. It also had knots in it that looked like a demonic face. Whenever you walked into that room in the middle of the summer, it felt like an ice box. The windows were painted shut, and there were no fans or AC. It was weird as hell. I had a creepy vibe about this room, and I wouldn't go in there. One night, when I had to go to the bathroom, I stepped out of the bedroom, and I heard footsteps behind me. I looked behind me and didn't see anyone. I freaked out and ran towards the bathroom, terrified. At the same time, I heard footsteps running down the stairs from the attic towards me. I made it to the bathroom out of breath. There was no one to come to my aid. After hunkering down for I don't know how long, I finally worked up the courage to return to my bedroom for some much-needed rest. The next day, my girlfriend, Renee, came over to stay with me. She's very sensitive to spiritual vibes and wanted a tour of the house. As I walked her through the place, she pointed out spiritual hot spots in certain areas. The attic, the basement, and the room on the second floor across from my room. She said the attic was where the servants used to reside, and she still could feel their presence. The basement was where the most intense anger came from. The room across from my bedroom was where an old woman had died years ago. One night, when she was staying over, she went to the basement to do the laundry. She went to grab the laundry from the dryer, and she felt as if someone was watching her. She spun around and saw what looked like angry slaves from the Civil War era. They slowly crept towards her with retribution in their eyes. She panicked and ran upstairs to the bedroom and said to me, I'm done with this place. I'm out of here. I said, what happened? She said, I saw something in the basement. It looked like a shadow, but I can't be positive. It scared the shit out of me. I replied, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not going back down there. If you want the laundry done, you go down there. I said, fine, I will. And I went downstairs. When I got to the basement, I put the laundry in the hamper and started carrying it up the stairs when I felt something following behind me up the stairs. 
I turned around and saw something following me. It was gray and cloudy and getting closer. I ran up the stairs and into the bedroom. Renee asked me if I saw it. I said, yes, I did. Suddenly, we heard a knock at the bedroom door. We froze in terror. We saw a fog-like substance seep under the door. She backed away screaming. I charged the door and threw it open, but there was nothing there. I yelled into the hallway, Come and get me, you fucking pussy! Renee exclaimed, What the fuck are you doing? I told her that I was going to stand up to this bullshit. She grabbed a crucifix off the wall and took her place by my side. We waited in anxiety-filled anticipation for what was to come next. After waiting for what felt like hours, we went to bed. The next day, I went to the attic to get some things I stashed there when I first moved in. As I climbed the stairs, I heard movement. I paused to listen closer, thinking it was probably a raccoon or some other small animal. But it sounded like someone walking around, almost pacing back and forth. I crept up the creaking steps to the attic door and listened. I could hear talking, but it wasn't English. It was almost a mumbling, but I could tell it was a different language. I reached for the doorknob, and it was ice cold. Abruptly, the doorknob turned on its own and flew open so hard it smashed into the wall. My natural reaction was to get into a defensive posture. I was ready to kick the intruder's ass. I looked around the huge multi-roomed loft. Dust was flying everywhere. It was obvious that no one, other than me, had been up there in a while. Several pieces of furniture from a bygone era were covered in sheets. I located the boxes I was looking for, but they had been moved from where I had last put them. The dust on the floor showed that they had been slid to a different position. I looked under the sheets just to make sure there were no trespassers hidden under them. I found no one. Also, there were no footprints in the dust, human or animal. I scratched my head in bewilderment, but shrugged it off. I grabbed my things and went back downstairs. I asked Renee, if she had been in the attic. She said no. I told her what had happened, and she got a little freaked out. At that point, she stated that the house is haunted. She asked me if I knew the history of the house. I said, I didn't think about it until now. I'll definitely have to ask the landlord about it when I deliver the next rent check. Later on, while we were watching Amazing Race, in the living room. We heard some noises on the floor above us. It was a pitter-patter of little feet scampering back and forth. We looked at each other in horrified wonder. I jumped up and bounded up the stairs, two steps at a time. When I reached the landing, I saw small, wet footprints going up and down the hallway like that of a child. I tracked the footprints back to the bathroom when I got there, the water was running in the clawfoot tub. When I reached to turn the water off, I saw a small boy laying in the bottom of the tub, submerged in the water. His eyes were open, but staring up blankly. He was blue and badly bloated. I screamed, Holy shit! I stumbled backwards and ran into the sink in horror, knocking several things to the floor. Renee heard the commotion and ran upstairs. When she got there, she asked, What the hell happened? Are you okay? All I could do was point to the bathtub with a shocked look on my face. She looked and saw the boy. Renee said she saw the boy on her initial tour of the house. Thinking he was just a boy, she didn't say anything about him. She turned off the water drained the tub, and the boy disappeared. As we made our way down the hallway, back to the living room, the demonic-looking door 
across from our bedroom, flew open with a crash. Startled, we ran towards the room. When we got to the doorway, there was a cold wind whipping around the room like a tornado. Furniture was getting thrown everywhere. In the middle of the room was an apparition of an old cackling hag. She was levitating and reaching out her long, talon-like hands towards us. Unexpectedly, the door slammed in our face. We looked at each other in utter horror. We simultaneously said, Nope, and ran to the car, fearing for our lives. I immediately drove to the landlord's house to break the lease. When I explained why, he didn't act surprised and told me that he's always had a hard time keeping tenants longer than a month. I asked what's the story about the place. The landlord went on to say, with the house being so old, there have been many deaths inside it. He said the actual number is unknown, but there seems to be four main areas that the spirits inhabit. The basement was where slaves from the Civil War were imprisoned, beaten, and starved to death. In the attic, a chambermaid had died giving birth as a result of an unwanted pregnancy. In the bathroom, a boy had drowned after slipping in the tub and banging his head. And in the demonic door bedroom, a crazy grandmother was locked in the room because the family thought she was possessed. When a priest was brought in to do an exorcism, it went sideways, and she died as a result. I asked the landlord why he didn't tell me about this in the first place. He said, if I did, would you have signed the lease? I said, of course not. He had no issue with giving me my security deposit back, but kept the last month's rent I paid up front. He said it's going to take at least that long to get someone else to move in. From now on, I know there are going to be certain questions I ask every landlord before I sign a lease. The Monument A major by the name of Reginald Rush received a letter in the mail that stated, Attention all veterans that served in the Battle of Gettysburg are cordially invited to participate in multiple monument ceremonies and honoring a few veterans who bravely served on this hollowed field that changed the course of the war between the states. Help us honor the lives that were lost on those harrowing three days that changed the course of our country. Ceremonies to take place two weeks from today at Gettysburg Field. The grizzled major read the letter with trepidation, but ultimately decided to go to honor the friends that he lost and his fellow comrades. The old weathered Union officer arrived two weeks later and stepped foot on the field for the first time in 40-plus years. The old major was an officer in the 44th New York Infantry Regiment and served in the 3rd Brigade that helped defend Little Round Top. He took in the sights and festivities of the day, catching up with friends he served with that he hadn't seen in decades. A lot of the boys even came dressed in their old military uniforms. After a few monument dedications, it was now time for the defense of Little Round Top dedication, which the old major participated in. He left his friends and decided to walk towards the ceremony by himself. As he walked towards the hill, he felt an uneasiness he hadn't felt all day. And as he got closer, an overwhelming sadness washed over his body. He stopped in his tracks, looked up in the sky, and began to cry. As he looked back down and wiped away the tears, he thought he heard muffled yells off in the distance 
and then continued musket fire. The major had a confused look on his face at this point. There shouldn't be any gunfire here. Who could be shooting, he thought. The sky began to darken as he turned and continued towards the hill. Off in the distance, he thought he saw a line of men, all dressed in uniform, head into the tree line, heading up the hill. Now he didn't think too much of it, because a lot of the veterans decided to wear their uniforms. But the odd thing was, it looked like they were all shouldering muskets. As he approached the tree line, he saw no trace of that line of men that he saw enter the woods, and he began to feel an eeriness chill his bones. When he entered the woods and started up the hill, he noticed it was completely silent. Where were the birds chirping, the bugs, the sounds of nature, he thought. But there was nothing, just dead silence. Halfway up the hill, he could see the covered monument and a row of what looked like to be Union soldiers. No shock there, he thought. Just some of the men in my regiment ready to see our monument revealed. The only thing he thought was odd was how did they get up there before him? He had started towards the hill before anyone else. The old major was getting tired. He put his head down and pushed up the rest of the hill. When he got to the top, he smelled what seemed to be gunpowder, which he thought was strange, but even more terrifying to the major was the row of men he saw standing at the top of the hill were no longer there. Not a trace of them was evident. He stood there in shock. Not long after that, the men in his regiment and the ceremony officials joined him on top of the hill, joking with him on how fast he made it up here. He didn't tell anyone what he had seen. They would think he was mad, but he knows what he saw. He knew at that point the men he had seen must have been ghosts. People just don't appear and then disappear without a trace. Coupled with the feelings he felt and the strange and eerie sounds he heard, he knew this was a haunted place. He took part in the monument ceremony with his fellow men. But after that day, he never set foot on that field again. Singing Civil War Ghost Girl Hey everyone. So this weekend, my husband and I made our first trip to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We stayed at an inn that was once inhabited by a girl named Tilly Pierce and her family. And during the Civil War, the house was a makeshift hospital. I've never had any experiences with the paranormal, so I wasn't expecting to here, even though it said the house is haunted. The first night we stayed there, Sunday, we decided to take a walk around town, around 9.30 to 10 p.m. While we were getting ready, the light on the nightstand was flickering like crazy. Creepy, but could be explained, so we just unplugged it. We headed out for a walk, and no one was out. It had just rained, and the bars and restaurants were closed. So not much to do, but we were new in town and wanted to scope things out for the daylight. We got back in at almost midnight, climbed up the creaking stairs, and to our room. To briefly describe our room, it was a street view room that sat above the dining room area of the house. The other guests in the inn were fast asleep by the time we got back. We sat on the bed for about 10 to 15 minutes, and out of nowhere, we heard a young girl start singing. I'd say, mid-song, no music. The song sounded like some type of hymn or maybe a popular song among the young people of that time. After about 30 seconds of singing, a muffled woman's voice, almost scolding, 
said something like, you're 15. And that's all we could make out. Again, no one was on the sidewalks, and we saw the other guests, and no young girls were in attendance. The sounds came from directly below us in the dining room area, and we had just walked in about 20 minutes prior to a darkened house. We both looked at each other in shock, but still didn't register that it could be a spirit that we just overheard. Monday came and went, and Tuesday morning we gathered for breakfast at the dining room table of the inn with the other guests. The innkeeper was talking about the history of the house and had mentioned that he brought a psychic into the house, and she had felt the presence of a young girl, possibly Tilly. Another guest says, Wasn't she fifteen? My husband and I practically broke our necks, looking at each other, when we recalled what we heard Sunday night. Now Tilly didn't pass away in the house, or even Gettysburg, but could it be a residual haunting? We both heard it so clear and loud, it was like we were hearing a snippet of a memory, but it wasn't bad or scary. It was actually very beautiful. The Riley Soldier As I've said before, though I've experienced many hauntings in my life, I don't really ever see ghosts. There was at one time with the woman sitting on my couch, staring at me. And there is this story. September 2020, I was taking my wife to work, as I did almost every night of the week. On the way, we drove through this little country town of Riley, near Oxford, Ohio. On the road we were on, there was a big hill going down into the town. We had been that way a ton of times, so we knew all of the little landmarks, trees, road signs, mailboxes, etc. Right behind the big green sign that said we were in Riley, there was a man standing there on the side of the road, looking our way. Because he was something out of the ordinary, I quickly looked over and got a good look at him for the brief second I had before we passed by. At that same time, my wife saw him, and she said before I could, Oh my God! Did you see that? I asked her what she saw, and she told me exactly what I saw. He was a Civil War soldier, and he was not a person in costume. She said she saw a detailed face, but I didn't. For starters, he was mostly white and glowing, like my headlights were really lighting him up. But they weren't shining directly on him, and he was bright. I was drawn to his face because of what I saw. It was just a blank, white, glowing area. He had his right leg up on the slight hill to the road and had his rifle in his hand, holding it to the ground like a cane. He had a cape he had on, and it seemed like he wasn't just white, but shades of light gray, though glowing white. And that was it. We purposely drove that way every night after that, until she lost her job because of the pandemic, just hoping to see him again. But we never did. I wanted to stop by at the house near where he was at to ask them if they had ever seen him or if maybe they had a costume from the Civil War and they were just hanging out freaking people out. Though I'm not sure how they would have pulled off the glowing and faceless appearance. But I haven't yet and probably never will. Oh yeah, the other cemetery in Riley is where one guy who was not known for telling any tales, let alone tall ones, told my dad once that he drove by and saw a werewolf there. The whole area 
is creepy. Old Victorian House and Civil War Hotspot. I guess I'll start with a little background. The house was built in 1860, not far from the Antietam National Battlefield in Maryland. My family moved there in September 2010, and being an eccentric child, I was really hoping for some paranormal experiences. But for the first two years, absolutely nothing happened. Sure, I felt creeped out when going to the bathroom at night due to the window by the toilet that showed the dark storage room. But other than that, there was nothing. And then in 2012, activity started to randomly occur. The first incident I can remember is that my then toddler brother spilled baby powder all over the dark brown floors. We left it there because we were late for an event. But when we returned home, there was a large boot print in the center of it. My father was only a size eight in men's and there were no signs of anyone breaking into the house. A month later, my mom went to the hospital due to a labor scare, leaving myself, my older sister, and a few other kids home alone overnight. We all decided to sleep in our parents' room. Note, this is where the boot print was before. I couldn't sleep that night because I kept feeling like I was being watched. Oddly enough, it wasn't from the creepy door to the storage room or the wide gaping closet with some sort of laundry chute, but rather right in front of the door leading out of their room. I watched the door carefully until I fell asleep, only to be wakened moments later by a bang somewhere else in the house. And when I looked at the door again, I saw a tall, shadow standing there. It was easily the size of the door with some sort of top hat atop his head. I sat there watching it for a long time. As car lights flashed through the windows, the shadow never dimmed or moved. I was too afraid to wake anyone up. After my new sister was born, whenever our parents would leave the house, we would hear loud footsteps walking across the hallway upstairs by our parents' room, through the kids' room, and back. Obviously, no one else was home. Parents always called it a draft, but we knew better. In 2013, our lease was up, and we planned on moving west. During this time, us kids started feeling an unwelcoming presence throughout the house, particularly when our parents weren't around. I wish I could call it paranoia, but I know it was more than that. Papers would knock off of the desk. Chairs would suddenly break. A chandelier fell from the ceiling onto our dining table. I had to have someone in the dark kitchen with me while I washed dishes because I always felt like there was someone standing in the hallway in front of the staircase that led to our parents' room. Eventually, as one of my sister's health was declining due to epilepsy, on top of all the other events, my parents decided to get a priest to bless the house. It was blessed shortly after we moved in, but this seemed to need a bit more power. Minutes after this guy leaves, we hear a blood-curdling shriek come from the dirt cellar, so loud it could be heard from anywhere in the house. There were no more major events after that, just an overall creepy feeling. The house went through three tenants in a year after we left and is now an office. What we found out later was that just across the street used to be the town cemetery, which was allegedly moved at some point in the past. Considering the Battle of Funkstown 
went on right in front of the house. There could have easily been fatalities on that day as well. There were also two recorded deaths in the 1940s and 50s, an old woman and a man. They had lived there for decades. Perhaps they didn't want to let go of it. Old Battlefield One time, my friends and I were walking through an old battlefield, heavy woods. My friends and I got lost and truly couldn't find our way out. When we were deep in the woods, we started hearing trumpets playing, almost like it was leading us out. We kept saying, oh, they're doing a Civil War reenactment, and we're brushing it off. When we got out of the woods, we realized it completely stopped. We went back to my friend's house, whose house is right on the woods line of the old battlefield, and heard nothing also. My friends and I are convinced that the trumpets were trying to lead us out of the woods. <laughs>